and I'm going to pin Elaine so that she is our speaker and everyone can see her. And uh, let's go ahead. It's an honor to welcome you. Well, thank you very much, Christina. And, and thank you all for having me tonight. I'm really pleased to be here after three times. It's like, this is our charm now tonight. So um, I think it'll be a very interesting uh, hour, but maybe a little less than that, what I'll be talking about. Um, just to very briefly introduce myself and then tell you what it is that I'll be addressing tonight. Um, because most of you, I think, know me, but there might be a few who don't. Um, I grew up in Esco, Minnesota, so I'm one of the northern Minnesota girls and came down to the Twin Cities. It sounds like a relatively familiar story to go to school, and I've just never gone back. So I'm still down here in the Twin Cities, um, but, but love Minnesota, and I'm really enjoying my time um, as the honorary consul. It's been very, very interesting. I am an immigration lawyer, and I have been an immigration lawyer ever since I graduated from law school in 1985. Um, it's been a long time that I've been doing this, and I'll be addressing a little bit of that as we're talking tonight about um, the topic. So what I'm going to try to do, and we'll, wish me luck, I'm going to try to share my screen so that I, because I do have a PowerPoint. Um, I do want to also tell you that um, I'm going to apologize in advance. The very first two slides of the PowerPoint look very professionally done because they were, because our firm has a nice looking PowerPoint template. And then the rest of it, I'm sorry to say, I'm not very good at getting pictures in, so it's kind of boring looking, um, but it'll get us through the topics. <laughs> so that's where we're going to go tonight. So let me see if I can get my screen to share. So that's going to be my first top challenge here. Uh, can people see my screen? Yes, that looks good. I'd also like okay. to add, if I may, that if yep. anyone has questions, please save them to the end, and then we'll ask people to put them in the chat, which you can find on the bottom bar. There, you should be able to just enter in any questions you have. Okay, I'm sorry, all yours. <laughs> Great. Oh, no problem at all. That was that's a very good point to make. Um, so anyway, tonight, what I want to talk about. Um, I'm not going to be able to work too much of Finland in because I'm going to talk quite a bit about the history and the challenges of US immigration to give people, I think, some context about what's really happening right now. And in particular, when we're looking at what's happened with the pandemic and kind of the chaos that's surrounding any kind of travel any place in the world. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a really fascinating topic. So I think we're going to have some fun with it. Um, so I'm going to start with first just get, Let's see if I can get my slides to change. That would be good too. There we are. Um, this is just the speaker slide. We'll move right on beyond that. All right, so I'm bringing us way back when we're talking about the history of US immigration and some of the challenges that have been there over the years. Um, all the way back to, you know, let's start with 1492 to 1874. But, you know, even farther back than that, obviously the very first immigrants were the Native Americans who came to the United States, uh, or what is now the United States Territory in Canada and Alaska, um, back about 12, anywhere from 12,000 to 30,000 years ago, um, from crossing that Bering Strait in Siberia to what is now Alaska. Um, now by 1492, the Native American population was anywhere from two to 10 million. So there were a lot of people here, um, but Europeans didn't know that at the time. The first you know, permanent European settlement that was in the United States was established by Spain in 1565, and that was in Florida. And then there have been these um, settlements, European settlements since that time. So 1598 Spanish settlements in Texas and New Mexico. And we're gonna run through these slides, by the way, pretty quickly to get to the more meaty things of what's happening lately. 1607, colonists from England, Jamestown, Virginia. 1619, it's a long time ago, the first slaves were brought to Virginia. Um, 1620, we've got the Puritans who founded Plymouth. The Dutch in 1624, and then in 1638, um, we understand that some first Finns came, arriving with some other Nordic immigrants, founding New Sweden, which was along the Delaware River. 1699, the French founded a settlement in Louisiana. So we know we've got a lot of Creole going down, on down in Louisiana. And if you look at all of that, you know, hodgepodge, different countries that all were coming in at that time and from Europe. Um, during that colonial era, there really was no centralized regulation of immigration at all. It was not even really thought about at that point. Um, and in fact, even following the Revolutionary War, 
And the federal government really left immigration up to the individual states. And so there was much more of a hodgepodge on who was moving and where they were going. But at that time, there was more of that no matter what. It was just a new country just barely getting started and trying to figure out what they were going to do. Um, there was, a, in 1790, the Naturalization Act, first attempt by the federal government to create some uniformity among the states. And of course, who would be citizens of the country where we've got free white persons of good moral character. They could become citizens after two years of residence in the country. Of course, um, Africans and people of African descent uh, didn't acquire access to citizenship until, what, almost 100 years later, 1870. Now in 1798, we had the Alien and Sedition Acts, and those were the first laws related to immigration that included provisions authorizing the president to deport a foreigner deemed dangerous to the United States. So there's sort of this development of immigration over time. Who do we want in? Who do we want out? And there's a lot of um, interesting dispute about that over, over the years. 1819, there's a Steerage Act that came into effect, and that was really the first law devoted to immigration. Um, and that was the one that was establishing reporting of immigration to the U.S. by requiring these passenger manifests of arriving ships so that that would get turned over to customs, um, copies would go to the Secretary of State, information was going to Congress. So they were now starting to kind of get some in information about who was actually coming into the country and how many people were coming into the country. And of course, at that time, we had lots of land that was available in the country. Uh, we were growing quickly. The country wanted people in. So between the early 1800s, really through 1900, um, we do see that the United States is growing very, very fast. In 1819, the U.S. acquires Florida from Spain. 1848, the U.S. wins the Spanish-American War and got a huge amount of land. So that was the Texas, California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. And you can imagine the number of people that were living there that were set, they had been Mexicans and living in Mexico for many years, and now they're living in the United States. That sort of changed a lot of things for people in that part of the country. Um, and then in 1888, of course, the 18, excuse me, 1848 was the discovery of gold in California and the gold rush huge demands for workers at that time. So again, at that point, immigration is really more of how many people can we get in and how fast can we get them here? Now in the 1840s, there were immigrants from Germany and Ireland because of crop failures and the potato famine. And uh, they had their challenges coming in as do I think all immigrants because people are coming in and they're different. 18 62, U.S. government was encouraging immigration to the West, and there was a Homestead Act offering these free plots of land in the West to settlers, um, whether they were immigrants or native born in the United States, if they would agree to live on and develop the land for at least five years. I think there are probably a number of us that would have had some um, family members, some ancestors that may have come in, in in that under that law or something somewhat akin to that as they were opening up and really working into the Dakotas and some of the other parts of the country. Um, 1865, that was the end of the Civil War. Um, immigrants were coming in from Southeastern Europe. There were Russians, Poles, Austria-Hungary, Balkans. Immigrants from China were coming in in large numbers. And people were really looking to take advantage, if, to have these new opportunities to work, whether it was in the railroads, steel, oil, all kinds of different industries. And so at that point, of course, they were looking at, there are a lot of economic migrants coming in. That's something that we've talked about a lot over the years and you know, people are just coming for the economy. Well, that's kind of how people have always come. Um, it's the economy, <laughs> they're coming in for that, they're coming in for opportunity. And that's typically what immigration has been about for many years. But we've always had some um, disputes among ourselves as people are coming in. Um, between the 1840s and the 1860s, they, we brought in about 6.6 .6 million immigrants, which is a lot of people within that relatively short period of time. Um, in 1875, now we're starting to, as we grow, start to think about, do we really want everybody who's coming into the country? And we start thinking about, do we, are we going to try to keep some people out? So 1875, we see the first Exclusion Act. And that was against undesirables that were considered to be you know, criminals, 
prostitutes, and then Chinese contract laborers who of course had come in and done a lot of work on the railroads and a lot of work and labor out on the, in the West. 1882 was sort of a low period for us in terms of immigration because that was when the Chinese Exclusion Act came into being. And that really, it suspended immigration of all Chinese workers um, to the US for 10 years. Um, it barred Chinese immigrants from becoming US citizens. And it also pr provided handily for deportation of Chinese immigrants who were unlawfully present, who hadn't been able to maintain whatever paperwork they would have needed back at that time. Um, 1860s to the 1930s, there's more and more federal control over immigration, um, along with expanding this list of exclusionary grounds. So there was an anarchist exclusion act. So that was really the first act that was um, excluding people based on their political beliefs. 1907, another mm, exclusion of what we were considering at the time, imbeciles and feeble-minded people. But it was also excluding people who had um, physical or mental disabilities, TB, unaccompanied children coming in. Basically, if what they were looking for for a lot of those folks at that time was, are these people going to be able to support themselves or are they going to go onto the public roles? Uh, that is still part of what is going on with our immigration right now. And in fact, recently we've had um, some very interesting changes in public charge and a lot of questions being asked of people who are trying to come into the United States and stay even after they've been here for a while. Um, also added were crimes of moral turpitude, so you know things like fraud, bad intent sorts of crimes um, to exclude some of those people. Also in 1907, we were very, very busy excluding people. There was a gentleman's agreement um, with Japan that ended really the immigration of Japanese laborers into the U.S. at that time. Now, we, we keep moving along, 1870 to 1930, we still have a huge number of immigrants coming in. At that time, 30 million immigrants between 1870 and 1930, so really 60 years. There were 9 million during the first decade of the 20th century alone. And this time period is really when a lot of Finnish, uh, Finnish people came into the United States. And you know, from the history of Finland and what was the economy like, um, what was it like to be um, how could you get land? Um, what was happening in terms of wars or battles going on in Europe? So you see a lot of different uh, people coming in and then you also see some people leaving and then coming back. So there was a lot of back and forth. And I think with the Finns, there, were, there was certainly a lot of that going on. Um, in 1921, there was a quota law and it was, this was really the first attempt to get numerical limits on immigration. So at that point, they had capped overall immigration at 350,000 per year. Um, and what was interesting about that is how they res were restricting the numbers based on countries of where people would come from. So what they did is they looked back at 1910 and said, okay, where were people from? What countries were represented in the United States? And then they would take a certain percentage of those people who were being represented. So of course, what are we doing is we're kind of continuing to build ourselves with the same people that came in originally at that time. So there were lots of, you know, Western Europeans were pretty well represented. Um, other countries around the world, not so much. And so that was, that was the first attempt though that they really had in terms of how many numbers and where are people coming from. Um, during World War II and the early years of the Cold War, um, there were these contradictory tendencies going on. Um, they were expanding political grounds for exclusion. Um, of course, at that time, there were a lot of anti-Japanese feelings. Um, and so things were being tight on that side. Well, yet at the other side, um, there was some loosening of restrictions for other Asians other than Japanese. And then you know, there were some increased humanitarian refugee policies starting to come into place. So starting to think about asylum law that we have now in the United States was coming from this, this kind of this wave between World War II and the early years of the Cold War. Um, I think also to some extent thinking back about what happened in World War II when people wanted to come here and there were times when we said no um, to the Jewish refugees. 1952 brings us to an interesting period. Um, there was an Immigration and Nationality Act which really um, took all of these many different immigration laws that had been sort of passed haphazardly and put them all into one large comprehensive statute. And there is a, there's still a lot of that law in today's immigration law. So it's been around now for quite a while. Um, 
one thing about the 1952 laws, it did eliminate race as a basis for exclusion. Go us, that's a good thing. But they still had the national origins quota system. And so they were still looking at, you know, who's really in the United States now, we're going to bring in more of the same. And so they certainly do, were other people able to come in? Of course they were, but it was still being looked at in terms of who's already here and let's kind of keep things looking, looking the same, so to speak. Um, in 1965, an immigration act that abolished the national origin quota system. So now we were starting to really talk about having these numerical restrictions and how many people were coming in. Um, they set up in 1965 a, what's called a preference system for family-based immigration and employment-based immigration. And that system is essentially still in place. So that if I, as an immigration lawyer, am talking to a client who's interested in immigrating to the United States and I want to find out, are you gonna come on a family-based route or are you gonna come through employment? Um, hopefully you won't have to come through asylum. That's because of the history you've had to go through already. And today we've got some bad situations for people trying to seek asylum, needless to say. Um, or if it's maybe the diversity lottery, which is a much more modern way for people to come to the States. Um, with the, with the and just as an example for a family-based immigration case, and what do these preferences mean? There's a family-based um, immediate relative, which is not a preference at all. It's an immediate relative, a child of a U.S. citizen or a spouse of a U.S. citizen. Um, immediate relatives can come in any time. You, you have to get the paperwork in order, so it's, you have certain things you have to go through before you can come, but you don't have to wait in line in case there are more people that are uh, looking for visas than there are visas available. But then you also get into these other preference categories, family-based first preference, family-based second preference third preference and so on. And it really ties into, are you an adult son or daughter of a US citizen? Are you a permanent resident and married to a permanent resident? And so they start looking at different numbers based on the relationship that you have as a family-based preference category. Um, family-based also, by the way, is what they used to, what they've been calling more recently chain migration. Um, and that's something that the administration has been somewhat against. We haven't been hearing much about it recently, um, but, Chain migration, sometimes the way that it's spun is it sounds like you know people come in, there's an anchor person and they just start bringing in the family, the whole family, all the cousins, uncles, aunts, you know, distant relatives, which you know, it really doesn't work that way. We're really talking about nuclear families when people immigrate based on family relationships. It's spouses, children, parents. And so to try to bring in many more people takes a very long period of time and most people don't, don't do it that way. Um, siblings, for example, right now, if I'm a US citizen and I wanna bring in one of my siblings from overseas, um, we have about a 14 year wait before they'd be able to come. So it's, it's lengthy. Um, there is, a, uh, employment-based preferences are also out there. I won't get into that right now. I just wanted to touch a little bit on the family-based piece. 1986, okay, so this brings me back to when I started practicing as a young lawyer. Um, the Immigration Reform and Control Act was one of the biggest changes to immigration that came into being since 1952. And I was a brand new lawyer at that time. And in that way, I guess I felt pretty lucky because I had to learn this whole immigration law, but so did everybody else who had been practicing immigration for a long time because there were so many changes to it. The big changes that came through at that time um, where what they were really trying to do is let's get a handle on the um, illegal immigration. So people coming in and just staying, they didn't have papers. And so what they wanted to do um, was to charge of a carrot and stick idea. The, the, the government knew they had millions of people in the United States that were living underground. Um, they were paying taxes, but there was a cash economy. They were always living in fear basically. And they really wanted to be able to get these people into the rest of the society so that they could be contributing members of society. And so what they did is they came up with an idea for what's called, what was called legalization at that time. So people could, if they could prove that they were in the United States illegally for a certain period of time after a certain date, they could ultimately get a path to a green card. So that was 1986. And this, remember, I think this was Ronald Reagan was president at that time. So as a Republican administration, which was very interesting, 
Um, what they also did, those two, is they introduced the I-9 system. So if people are, if you're familiar with working and you start a new job and you have to complete an I-9 form. So what does that mean? What that really meant is that people need to now be able to document who they are and that they are authorized to work in the United States. That's what the I-9 system is all about. And that's what came into being also in 1986. So this stick was to say, employers, you shouldn't be running around employing all of these people that you know are illegal. You should be checking to make sure you know who you're employing and you should be checking to make sure that they're authorized to work. And if you're not complying with that, we're gonna be issuing fines, which could go all the way to jail time for people. But that was what was happening in 1986. It was a sea change in terms of how immigration was being processed. Um, 1990, Another interesting year, uh, immigration, they raised the annual cap on immigration. Uh, and initially from 1990 to 1994, there was a cap on immigration of 700,000 a year. And then after 1994, they decreased that somewhat to 675,000 and then broke it down to, as on the, on the slide here, it's 480,000 for family-based immigration, 140,000 employment-based and then 55,000 for diversity immigrants, which um, a number are when they, they came through with the diversity lottery. And then there's also you know, people that would be coming in, um, whether it's an asylum or something like that, that eventually get green cards and are able to stay. So we still are working with numbers caps, and that means that we run out of visas a lot of times during the course of the government's fiscal year. And so then people end up waiting for longer periods of time to be able to get their green card in hand, which is permanent residence. That's not citizenship, it is permanent residence. Um, but it allows you to stay here and work here, and eventually that gives you a path to citizenship if you want it. 1996, we're back to the enforcement. The Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, of, known by immigration attorneys all over the place as IRA IRA. Um, this is an act that really gave um, some new grounds for inadmissibility. It was seen as very harsh when it first came into being, and frankly, it is harsh, and it's still there. So um, what has happened with that act is that they decided they were gonna expand what's an aggravated felony for people to be um, deported from the United States um, for exclusion purposes as well. They created something called expedited removal, um, which means if somebody comes to the border and they are not, they don't have the right documents um, to be able to come into the United States, um, or if a uh, Customs and Border Protection officer thinks that somebody is uh, lying to them at the border, they can put them on an airplane and send them right back to their home country. And that does happen, um, and it, it doesn't happen all the time by any means, but it certainly does happen. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to then be able to try to come back if somebody has gone through an expedited removal process um, because they'll usually they will take a statement and they will say these are the reasons you are being excluded um, or ex and removed from the United States and it's usually not for a purpose of you know somebody is missing a dot of, over an I but it's typically something like um, I'm coming in to be I just want to come and visit and tour around the country and in my briefcase I've got all these things showing that I'm actually going to be working in the United States so things like that can be problematic. Um, this also established what are called three and 10 year bars on people being able to return to the United States if somebody has been unlawfully present in the United States. What unlawfully present means is somebody who's overstayed their authorized period of stay. And that can happen somewhat accidentally sometimes because people don't realize that mis a mistake could have been made when they came in or their passport expired. Different things can happen to people. Um, but if somebody is unlawfully present in the United States with this kind of an overstay, if they're unlawfully present for more than 180 days, they can be, when they leave the U.S., they're going to be barred from returning for three years. If they are unlawfully present for a year or more, they, if they leave the United States, they can't come back for 10 years. So it's as significant, frankly, as being deported. Um, although in deportation, you can sometimes be out for a much longer time and sometimes forever. 9-11 changed a lot. It changed all of our lives and um, it changed immigration in a very big way. Um, immigration was uh, looked at in a very negative light initially because of course somebody gave uh, visas to the people who came to go to flight school. 
and just wanted to learn how to get up in the air and fly and didn't really care about landing. Uh, that was a hard thing for the Immigration Service to get through. And of course, they, there were a lot of enhanced national security and law enforcement measures to, that came into being after 9-11. Um, much more vetting was going on of people coming into the United States. After that time in you know, 2001, there were some additional tweaks to the immigration laws in the 2000s, but it was relatively, I'd say, a qu more quieter period in terms of what was happening and how our practices were going and what we were doing with people. We were kind of feeling a little bit comfortable about what was happening um, until 2016. And 2016, we had a, a new administration come into being. Now, um, this is where I wanna focus a little bit about what's been happening with US immigration since the Trump administration came in. Um, it's, it's been a very a significant change in what's happening with immigration. Um, people coming into the United States, people want to immigrate to the United States, but even people who wanna come temporarily are having a much more difficult time coming into this country. And from an immigration lawyer's perspective, um, I've been doing this for 35 years, and immigration has always been a political hot potato. Their Congress is always wrestling over immigration. They keep trying to come up with a way to do this universal revamp of the immigration laws. And politically, it's been extraordinarily difficult to do that. So we did see some things coming through with, for example, in the Obama administration. You know, what do you do about the dreamers? Um, Obama finally just came through with a presidential, um, um, what's the term I'm looking for here? Um, the ex an executive order for DACA. Well, these are the dreamers to say, these people can stay. We need to find a way for them to be able to get employment authorization so that they can legally work in the United States. They can go to school and they may be able to at some point get a pass to citizenship. Um, and the dreamers, of course, you know, who are the dreamers? The dreamers are these children who came to the United States with their parents and then their parents overstayed. And of course, the children are staying with their parents. So the, the children are not at, at fault on any of this, but they've been in the United States, many of them since, you know, two years old. And they really don't know any other country other than the United States. So that's one of the big issues that um, Obama was, uh, was trying to address. Congress has never really fixed that or done anything with it. President Trump has tried to do some different things with it, um, so thus far somewhat unsuccessfully, but we're still in kind of this flux of lawsuits and um, uncertainty for these people right now. And so it's a, it's a very difficult situation for them. But it's just, I guess I would say, one more example of what's happening with immigration. This is a very difficult time. Now, um, what did Donald Trump do when he, he became president? You know, he was sworn in uh, mid-January of 2017. And one of the very first things he did, did was to come out with um, executive, an executive order to ban people from Muslim predominant countries from coming into the United States. Uh, there were a couple of other countries in there. But um, it was what was you know, called the Muslim ban. And it was a big surprise to immigration lawyers all over the United States when that first came through. And people were very um, excited and disturbed about it. That, if you remember back to 2017, it seems like a long time ago right now, there were people in the airports um, trying to help people who were coming in who were stuck in airplanes in the sky when the executive order came through to try to help them get into the United States or explain what their rights were or what their rights weren't. Um, so that was, a, I'd say, several weeks of real unrest and uncertainty about what was happening. Now, that first Muslim ban, so to speak, the Muslim, Muslim ban, I guess you would say, so to speak, um, was unsuccessful with the Trump administration. They came up with another one. That one was also struck down as discriminatory, as the first one was. And then there was a third iteration where I think they finally, um, the administration finally got the, the message that um, they couldn't be doing this in terms of you know, religion, um, political beliefs. So what they really needed to be focused on and what they finally did focus on was national security. And that the president has a lot of power over who can come into the United States. So it's that border power. And they based it on national security. You know, are these people a security threat coming in? It's that third ban that 
finally was approved by the US Supreme Court and is still in effect, but kind of does get changed a little bit. There, there are some countries that have been on the ban and then they've Im improved in, according to the government, how they process visas and who they vet um, and what's happening in those countries and how they let, I guess, US consulates process visas and vet people. Um, so there have been some improvements. And so some, country, some of the countries have come off the list and one or two have gone on it. Uh, so that was the very first thing that we saw. And then later that year, again in 2017, so in April of 2017, there was another executive order that came out. And this executive order was buy American, hire American. Laudatory ideas. Um, the US wants people in the United States to have jobs. We want industry to be here. So we want Americans to buy American and hire American. Now, this particular executive order as it came out um, has had a huge impact on employment-based immigration, which is really the area that I practice in. And it was, it was clear from the start when this um, executive order came out that there's a particular program that was really in the crosshairs of the administration, and that is the H-1B visa program. Um, H-1B visas are non-immigrant visas. That means that somebody comes here temporarily um, they could later move into a green card, but the idea of the H-1B is a temporary work visa. People can be here a total of six years. The visa itself, um, to, to get an H-1B visa, um, there has to be a company that's going to sponsor somebody. The job that they are sponsoring them for needs to be one that requires at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field of study for entry into the position. The individuals coming in to take the job need to have the degree that's required or a closely related degree or the um, equivalent of that degree that could be done through a combination of education and employment or through work experience alone but it's many years of work experience alone if you're doing that um, the employers also have to guarantee that there are certain wages that they're going to be paying to those h1b workers so that program has been around for many many years it's kind of this workhorse program for companies that need to bring in people from other countries to work. Um, many people come in as you know, software engineers, um, scientists, chemists, um, marketing professionals. I mean, it's, it's at any number as long as it's a, comp a job that really requires a degree. It doesn't require work for the company overseas. It, it can be a new hire. Now, um, the administration is really going after that program because they really felt that there were certain companies that were taking advantage of it and really abusing the system. And the reality of that is, I think, to some extent, true. To a large extent, not. Um, there are going to be bad apples in every program. And um, there have been some companies that have taken advantage of that program. Now, there are only 85,000 of those available each year of those visas, and we're oversubscribed every year. But what was happening is that there were some companies that would file you know, 1,000 petitions trying to get their cases selected for the 65,000 or actually 85,000 if you count an additional amount that you can get. Um, really trying to get those visas. And so you'd see a lot of those visas going in and then there were, there have been comments of course about, um, well, I'm in the IT industry and my company is outsourcing to this consulting company. Um, the people working for the consulting company are all from outside of the United States. They're here on H-1B visas and they're being paid less than I am and I have to train them how to do my job and now I'm losing my job. Um, so that really has been where there's been problems with the H-1B program. But I'd say the vast majority of the companies that use that program use it in a good way. Um, so that is, but that is something that's been a very specific target for Mr. Trump. So when we file um, H-1B visa petitions, one of the other things that we're seeing is that we're seeing a lot of um, requests for evidence it becomes much more expensive because we have to respond to those. Um, we are seeing a lot more denials of cases than we ever have in the past. And so it becomes a much more rigorous program. And what that means then is that people aren't coming into the United States to work, they're working somewhere else. And so Canada has been a significant um, uh, recipient of people who have been unable to get H-1B visas in the United States. And Canada is still growing and they're very happy to have people coming in right now. And so we are also seeing um, large companies that have set up operations in Canada um, or in Mexico and that's where they put people if they need people 
to actually come in and do the jobs. Um, one of the things that I find frustrating with this is that I think about the United States and all of the people that have come in over the years. And one of the reasons we have been, I think, so successful is because we do bring in people from all over the world. We're bringing in new ideas. We're bringing in new ways of doing things. And um, if we are starting to cut off that influx of people in a way that we're really walling ourselves in instead of walling other people out, um, I'm concerned about losing that opportunity to have new ideas and new capabilities. And, and also looking at all of the companies that really have started by, been started by immigrants or their children, um, the Googles of the world. Many, many, many of the largest companies in the United States have been started by immigrants or their, or their children. And that's something that I'd hate to lose. But I will go on. I can get off my soapbox and I'll talk a little bit more about other things that are happening. Um, there are other visa categories that have been impacted by the executive order of Buy American, Hire American. Um, old ones who are extraordinary ability. Um, those cases have been more difficult to get in. Intercompany transfers are having more difficulty coming into the United States. Um, those are people who are working for multi -com multinational companies and multinational companies want to rotate people around the world to bring in new ideas, but also to maintain company culture and company approaches. Um, again, it's becoming just harder to have, that, have people be able to come in and to get petitions approved. So, and then it becomes more expensive. So, you know, it's, it's sort of this discouragement of using immigration um, to run businesses, um, to continue to grow. And so that's something that's been a challenge. Uh, so we walk a fine line. We want Americans to have American jobs, definitely. But if there are immigrants or people coming in on non-immigrant visas that can help companies grow to hire more Americans, that's viable too. So I think right now we haven't been walking quite the fine line. It's been more of a, let's make it difficult to bring people in and more expensive. Um, and that's, I think, in the long run going to be a, an issue and a difficult one. Um, another thing that has come kind of out of this Buy American, Hire American policy has also been on what's something that's called extreme betting. And so if you know people who have been coming into the United States on employment visas um, or any visa where they've needed to go to a U.S. consulate to apply for a visa, um, there have been a certain number of cases where extreme vetting has come in. And what is extreme vetting? It's asking a lot more um, intrusive questions of people. Tell us about your family. Tell us about all the businesses owned by your aunts and uncles. Um, tell us, it would give us all of your social media accounts. We wanna look at them. Um, we wanna look at your finances. I mean, it's, the, the questions can be very, very um, challenging to answer sometimes especially if you don't know your family well and you don't know what businesses your aunts and uncles have, run, have been running. But it's a, it's a challenge that we've been facing and seeing um, quite a bit, I would say, over the last couple of years. So again, it's just like one more thing. It's kind of like another pebble going into the big bucket and eventually things are going to flow over. So we were dealing last year with all of these changes, you know, extreme vetting, and I'm worried about, you know, every case that they look at, they're going to start requesting evidence on. Um, I'm concerned about the number of cases that are being denied that didn't used to be denied. Uh, people are stressed because they, you know, they've, their case has been approved four times already, and now this time they're being asked more questions. So it was a highly stressful, difficult time in 2019, and then we came to 2020. And now we're immigration stress on steroids. It's really become interesting. <laughs> so, you know, what's happened with the pandemic? Well, you know, none of these things have been, that have caused more stress in immigration over the last three years, three and a half years, are going away. They're all still there. Um, we filed petitions with USCIS. We've still got a lot of requests for evidence. We've got a lot of stressed people worried that they're going to have to leave the country. All of that is there. And then the pandemic came into being. And so what's happening now? Now we have presidential proclamations. And the presidential proclamations that we're seeing, um, the 14-day travel bans. So you often hear President Trump talk about um, he kept China out early on. And to some extent, he did. Um, you know, he said people can't be coming in from China. Well, these 14-day travel bans are really what we're talking about. And the 14-day travel bans 
we're set up for saying country X or countries Y are not doing a good job of managing the coronavirus. And so we in the United States do not want people who have been in those countries coming across our borders until they have been out of those countries for 14 days, basically the quarantine period. Then after that, they can come in. And so the bans have come into effect in January with China. Um, Iran came shortly after that. Then all of the Schengen countries, which of course includes Finland, then the UK and Ireland, and we're missing one on here, the country of Brazil. Brazil came into being in, I'm trying to remember if it was May, I guess April or May, when, when Brazil came into that travel ban. So what do those travel bans mean? It, 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 it means that people um, cannot uh, come to the, straight to the United States from those countries. If they want to come to the United States straight from those countries, now are there exceptions? Yes, there are. Um, I should get to those first quickly. They are US citizens, lawful permanent residents can always come home. They don't have to go through the, you know, for any kind of a 14 day travel ban on them. Um, or else if it's a national interest exception and that's the government defines that. And it's really things like for a national interest exception, um, somebody is coming to work on COVID research or it's a doctor coming to treat COVID patients. Um, somebody who's coming in because they are, they're critical to some sort of work that's being done on essential infrastructure for the United States. Those are the kinds of cases that people can come in on. And people, in order to get those national interest exceptions, because these are of course foreign nationals, need to either apply for a visa at a US consulate and make their case there, or if they have already a visa in hand um, and want to come straight in, they, they need to get permission either from a consulate now or from Customs and Border Protection before they try to travel. Is there another way to, to do this? Yes, there is. Um, if somebody has the wherewithal and the ability and the time, um, it's possible to go to a third country where that is not a travel ban country, sit there for 14 days, and then come into the United States. And uh, with my people, I have lots of people that um, are from Brazil <laughs> and they are under travel bans. Um, I also have many people, of course, from Schengen countries. And so um, what we will look at a lot of times in the first instance is, you know, can you go to Mexico for two weeks? Uh, Mexico admits most people from around the world pretty readily. Um, not everybody, but most they will. And people can go to, you know, Cancun or one of the resort areas, kind of close themselves off into a hotel room because COVID is, you know, in Mexico too. They are certainly aren't being avoided. Um, be there for the 14 days. And then what we do is we tell them they need to fly into the United States. Um, you don't want to be driving in because we also have border issues with Canada and Mexico right now that are land border issues. So just bearing that in mind, um, that we have no non-essential travel at land borders between Mexico and the United States and be between Canada and the United States. And that means no leisure travel on a, through a land border. People can still fly, they just can't do it on a land border. Uh, so it's, does it make sense? Um, we have to talk to those governments about it, <laughs> but that's, that's what it is. Uh, but if people are coming into work, um, I just tell them to fly in. It's, it's a less stressful thing for the person who's traveling. Now there are also travel bans on immigrants who are seeking immigrant visas at consulates outside of the United States. Um, that travel ban came out in April. And at that time we thought, oh, breathe a sigh of relief. That's not gonna be a big deal. Um, but then 60 days later, when they had revisited everything and looked at it, they decided that people who are applying for new H-1B visas, new L visas, new J visas, um, can't get those visas. And that's going to last until the end of this year. Um, that's had a very significant impact on business immigration. Um, companies can't get new employees into the United States unless, again, there's an exemption. So what are those exemptions? Those are people... Um, who were in the United States when the travel ban was issued, Canadians, because Canadians don't need visas, so they don't have to worry about it. So they can come in more easily. So if you're Canadian, you're, you're doing pretty well. Um, there's a sprinkling of a few others, and then there are also national interest exceptions. Um, but what we are seeing with the national interest exceptions, um, it's interesting, they're talking again about the same kinds of, you know, COVID sorts of things, treating um, patients, you know, those people can get their visas and come here. 
Um, but also they're, they are looking a bit more at some economic needs with that particular national interest exception. Um, but one of the challenges that we're seeing around the globe is that the US consulates are inconsistent in what they consider national interest exceptions, how they're interpreting it, or if they will even listen to, an, to somebody trying to get a, a visa to come in. And so it's, it's messy. That's probably the best way I can describe it is it's just messy. Difficult to um, work with folks that are trying to get into the United States. Now, with that two, kind of that two-pronged issue uh, with the travel bans, so if I'm a person that needs to get a new H-1B visa and I happen to be at, say, in Finland, um, so I've got a 14-day travel ban as well, you know, what do I do? Well, I can try to make my case to the U.S. consulate to say it's in the national interest for me to come to the United States um, based on the criteria you've given me for the new visa criteria. Um, I may or may not qualify for the national interest exception for the 14-day travel ban though. And in some instances, what we are seeing is that people are getting their visas and they're sort of ignoring the 14-day travel ban at the consulate. We are also seeing people who will go in for their visa and they say, yeah, I think you meet the national interest exception on the economy side of this for the H or the L visa, but you don't meet the national interest exception, which is really COVID related for the 14 day travel ban. So I might give you a visa or I won't give you a visa and I won't give you a visa because I, I'm thinking that you're going to then, if I give you a visa, go to a third country and then come into the United States, which is perfectly fine to do. So then it's a matter of trying to talk with the consulate and educate them about really this is okay. I mean, this is one reason we have the 14 day travel ban. You just need to be placed someplace where you can quarantine. Uh, but we are seeing, again, different responses from the consulates about how they're gonna look at that. So we've had people who have been, yep, we're gonna approve your visa, we'll issue it, when, your tra when the travel ban is lifted. And we don't know when that's gonna be. And so people are still sitting and waiting. Um, so how do we manage with travel bans? We tell people don't travel, <laughs> just don't travel. If you're in the United States, don't go anyplace um, until we know what's happening at the consulate. If you've got a critical need, I mean, obviously people do sometimes and then we need to deal with it. Um, then we need to work with what the specific instances are that we're, that we're there on. So um, US immigration is, a real challenge these days. Um, but I will say uh, we're not the only ones. <laughs> Other countries around the world are facing the same kinds of issues. Um, there are countries that are still totally closed down. Some of the islands, for example, in the Caribbean are, won't let anybody in right now, even if they're a citizen of that country. Um, Ecuador was doing that for a period of time. Uh, and there are bans uh, going in both directions right now. So the European countries, of course, we've got the 14-day travel ban for coming into the United States, um, but U.S. passports are kind of, kind of, you know, uh, non grata in terms of trying to go into Europe right now. We really can't go and visit. Um, if one, somebody needs to go in and work or you've got a very, very strong reason, you've really got to be making your case and following the procedures that are out there. Um, there is, the European Union has a um, website, I think it's EU Reopen, if I'm remembering correctly, where you can find really good and up-to-date information on which countries are opening up and who they're opening up to. Um, so that's a very interesting place to go if you do need to travel or want to travel. Now I'm expecting we've got about nine minutes left. I would be more than happy to take questions. I think maybe some people might have questions about Finland because I didn't really talk much about Finland tonight. Um, I would be happy to do that to the extent that I can. Um, but also very happy to answer questions about U.S. immigration, which is what I live and breathe every day. Thank you. And I will go in and see if I can see on, anything on chat. Oh, I should quit sharing my screen. That might help. Let's see if I can get through. Yep, we're at the question stage. We'll go there. So I'm going to ask if people have anything they'd like to ask Elaine to either um, enter it into the chat box or to go to the participants and you'll see there's a thing where you can raise your hand to indicate that you have a question and go ahead and unmute yourself and ask that question. Any questions? Uh, 
uh, are the caps still the same? Okay, I see a question. Um, are the caps still the same even with COVID? In terms of visas that are available? Yes, the caps are still there even with COVID right now. Um, okay, I, got, I have another question, interesting question. If the administration changes, will all of these problems go away or is it gonna take some time? It took time to get these problems into place. <laughs> And certainly the, you know, the COVID issues that have come about um, with travel, kind of travel chaos all over the world is gonna take time to fix. Um, I'm sure that some of these other things will take time as well. If the administration does change, um, I do think that things will improve in terms of my personal perspective as an immigration attorney and those of my clients who are trying to come into the United States or companies that I work with that are trying to higher international and international workforce. Um, I do also think, and you know, seeing what kind of what's coming down the pike in terms of um, new regulations that are being talked about from the current administration, that if, um, the, if the Republican administration stays in for another four years, or this, I should say the specific administration stays in for another four years, that it's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get much more difficult to um, bring in international, right, you know, foreign nationals into the United States, um, whether it's just coming in for work, coming in as a business visitor, and certainly to try to immigrate here. Um, for expedited removal, here's an interesting question. For expedited removal, who, uh, who makes that decision? That's, an, that's an, a very interesting one. It's actually Customs and Border Protection. It's those guys who sit at the immigration desks at the airport. They get to make that decision. Now, the guys that sit at the immigration desk at the airport, it's not the guy who's actually stamping the passport that makes that decision. Um, people get brought back into what we call the little room. It's kind of the small area where there's a supervisor and it would be a supervisor with Customs and Border Protection who would make that final decision and usually bring in a couple of other people as well. So they do bring it up the chain, but it is Customs and Border Protection that gets to make that decision. I had had a question, I think, earlier, um, and this will this will bring us over to the Finnish immigration side of things, um, about getting um, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Residence permits um, in Finland, and is it possible to you know do some repatriation? And um, yeah, there is it. Family based is is quite interesting, and so I don't know if people have ever had a chance to go and look at the consulate websites where they talk about residence permits. Um, but it is possible to get a residence permit going as far back as your grandparents. So if your grandparents were born in Finland, um, and Finnish citizens, and you can document that relationship back, it is possible for somebody to get a residence permit for Finland based on that. So that's kind of an interesting little fun fact to know um, if people are interested in something like that. So I always tell people, yeah, look at the look at the website. Um, one thing that I really like, I would say too, about the about Finland's uh, the consulate's website, is that frankly it's really good. Um, if you're looking to try to understand how residence permits work, whether it's for work, um, for school, uh, family based, it it really is one of the clearest websites I've seen. And I can tell you, I look at a lot of consulate websites because just because of the nature of my job. And that Finland has done a really good job on that. I'm, I'm sure there are others as well. I know the UK also has very robust um, websites, but it's, it's really pretty, pretty nice to use. Um, let's see. Ah, talking about exceptions for those rich and promising to start a company. That is a really good question. Okay, so people that want to come into the United States to start a company, um, there are the people that are doing the EB, what's called an EB-5, employment-based um, investment. So somebody that's coming in and it's going to be spending, oh, the, the prices have gone up. I think it's about 1.8 million to start up a company and then say you're going to employ 10 people. Um, that process is still in place. Um, they do see that they want to have that. And so it's still there. Um, but it's always been kind of a challenged program because there have been, some, there have been issues with fraud. There have been SEC problems, um, but it's still there. And, but it takes a long time to get people through that process. Um, and now with COVID and with the administration, it's, it has become more difficult for these folks too, just like it has for everybody else. But that program is still in place, the EB-5 program for investors. 
Um, there are also treaty traders and treaty investors for certain kinds of uh, cases for people that can come in as well. Those, that's also being challenged right now to an extent, um, just as just part of the overwhelming, everything's difficult with visas these days. So that's out there. Um, oh, I've got another question here. Not some really good questions. Um, let's see, have you seen changes to citizenship approval process? Um, yes, it has gotten slower in terms of processing the cases themselves. Um, one thing that I think is interesting and, and disturbing at the same time is that um, the Trump administration has started uh, a kind of a office to really dig into people who have naturalized to try to denaturalize people if they felt that they got their citizenship the wrong way. Um, fraud, for example, is what they're supposed to be looking for. And that they have kind of picked up the pace on that, but it's, it's still a very small office. And it's not like there are millions or hundreds of thousands of people that are being questioned. It's more like hundreds. Um, but that's what it is right now. But that's, that's an area that gives, I think, gives a lot of um, immigration practitioners pause and concern. Uh, you know, people have been, natural, have been naturalized and citizens for years, and suddenly the government is coming back. And there may have been, you know, no, no issue at all. It's just something looked a little odd in a case. Um, we did have a case that was questioned not that long ago on somebody who was at, when they were applying for citizenship, and they dug back into the green card, uh, when they got their green card and started asking them a lot of questions about that. Um, everything was ultimately fine. But it was really, you know, kind of makes your stomach turn when something like that happens. Um, so it's something that I think people just need to be aware of that it's out there and we just don't know if it's going to go much farther. Um, another good question, have there been any significant changes to student visas over the past uh, few decades? Yes, big time. <laughs> student visas have changed tremendously. Um, student visas, the typical ones are the F1s for university students. That's what we see the most, uh, the most often. And um, I would say, you know, practical training has changed considerably for students over the years, what they can get after they graduate. Um, just over this last year with COVID, there were some things kind of going back and forth at one point, um, you know, amidst so many schools had to go to remote learning because of COVID. And then the Trump administration was trying to get people to go back to school. And so at one point they were saying, um, you have to go back into classrooms or they were gonna start deporting students. So that was just earlier this year. And they did have to back off on that because it just really wasn't making any sense. Um, but they were still really encouraging um, students to have at least one class that was an in-person class and then the rest could be online. Um, exactly where that's going, I don't know. But I can tell you that um, the, student, uh, the student visas have changed considerably. Um, there's, there will be more to come. Um, the Trump administration is talking about trying to reduce um, the amount of optional practical training available. Um, students with STEM degrees, science, technology, engineering, and math, have been able to get more optional practical training than regular students. So they can get up to three years of optional practical training instead of the one year that most students get. And the Trump administration has been talking very hard about trying to get rid of that STEM extension and make everybody just get the one year if they're gonna get that at all. Um, let's see. You take exceptions. Okay, we got that one. Uh, any sense when Finns and Americans can travel to Europe? Well, if somebody is Finnish and has a Finnish passport, um, you can go to Finland. So if you've got your passport, you can go. Um, when can Americans travel to Europe? I think the Europeans are looking hard at us and our COVID uh, rates of infection. And if we're not seeing, you know, improvement, um, I think it's going to be quite a while before Americans are going to be going and darkening the doors of any of the countries in Europe, including Finland. Um, if, however, somebody is uh, qualified to get a residence permit, there could still be some, some other options for people to go in um, if they've got a residence permit. Um, people, for example, they've got a job and they apply for the residence permit and then they go through all of the process that needs to be done. They can go in, but they need to go through that excuse me, apply for that residence permit first. Um, in the past, in going to Finland, a lot of times I think people would be able to fly over because it's Americans, we could go over for 90 days, didn't need a visa, and so you could do some other things in the country. Um, with COVID, that has definitely changed. 
and um, people need to go through that residence permit process first before flying into Finland because you have to have the right paperwork to get into the country. Uh, let's see, are there any other, any other questions tonight? I think I've, I've utilized my time. It's, it's 8.02, so I've gone over by a couple minutes. So my apologies for that. I wanna be thoughtful about people's time. Uh, but I also want to say thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this tonight. And what great questions, really interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine.